The surgical management of a full thickness corneal perforation gets even more complicated when you have an associated damage to the anterior capsule and a traumatic cataract. Here are a few of the surgical principles that I use in the management of such cases. This young man presented to us with an injury that he sustained eight hours ago at his place of work with a steel object. The patient was explained the nature of the injury and the possible extent of the damages and a guarded visual prognosis consent was also taken. He was also explained for the need of possible multiple surgeries and the primary aim of this surgery was to just close down the eye that had ripped open. Let's now understand the surgical principles and the technique of managing such a case. The first step that I always perform is a very careful, guarded paracentesis incision. Achieving this enables me to always be able to gain access to the anterior chamber irrespective of how shallow or how deep it is. It is advisable to have more than one paracentesis incision to allow for the ease of instrumentation in and out of the eye. We now move to addressing the corneal tear itself. Adequate time is taken and the wound edges are inspected and refreshed. Very often you find fibrinous tissue even in a matter of hours opposing both edges of the wound. Once refreshed, the edges are clearly examined, the exact nature of the tear clearly visualized and understood, followed by a plan as to how to achieve the optimal closure of this full thickness corneal perforation. This is what you will observe in this part of the video. You will now observe how the edges of the wound are freshened. I like to use a firm cotton bud to perform this step. The fact that you have a disrupted anterior capsule makes matters slightly difficult. As you can see, there is some egress of cortical material whilst I freshen the wound in the area above the center of the nucleus. At this point, I'd really like to add that having a full thickness corneal perforation coupled with a damaged lens can make the management rather challenging. The lens involvement may range from just having a traumatic cataract, a cataract with a disrupted anterior capsule, a cataract with a subluxated lens and vitreous prolapsing in the wound, or even a traumatic aphakia as a result of the injury itself. Now each of these different case scenarios would be managed separately but the one principle I adhere to as long as I do have a full thickness corneal perforation whether or not there is a disruption of the anterior capsule or not I tend to deal with the corneal trauma at the first sitting and deal with the cataract at an entirely different sitting because at that point I'm likely to be able to work under a more controlled environment of a closed anterior chamber and with much better visibility because the corneal edema would have settled. Having said that, like in this particular case, as you can see the cortex is constantly coming out of the eye, that is cleared from the wound. So also, if it were to be vitreous that's prolapsing, I would perform a limited anterior vitrectomy so as to ensure that my wound is clear of any material, be it fibrin, be it cortex or be it vitreous. You will see in this manner, I ascertain even before I start to suture the wound that both the edges of the wound are absolutely clean and free of any debris of any sort. Now prior to starting the suturing, I just pass an iris repositor once to clear the space between the iris and the cornea. Thus far we have understood the principles of preparation of the corneal tear prior to suturing it. Let's now move to understanding the principles and the correct technique of suturing this corneal tear. It's extremely important that when you are taking the first suture, a perfect apposition between the two edges of the tear is maintained. This ensures a correct apposition for both ends of the entire suture. This would serve to ensure the optimal apposition 
of both ends of the chair absolutely perfectly with each other. The suture that is used is tenno nylon and this is how the sutures are taken. At the point of intended suturing, one edge of the tear is held firmly with the help of a colibri forceps and lifted up to offer some visibility of the depth of penetration of the needle and the suture is passed through 80% of its depth. The needle then passes through the other edge of the tear at approximately the same depth and then the needle is exteriorized. The suture is then cut and the two ends of the suture are now tied in a 3-1-1 knot. We now consider the extent of tightening of the suture. The cornea, you must remember, is fairly edematous, so I always tend to make the sutures rather tight. What I find when I do this is that once the edema settles, what I'm left with is an optimal apposition of the wound. You must always ensure a uniform level of tightness across the entire sutures. Now, at that point where I have achieved a significant wound closure, even by one or two sutures, it is time to try and form the anterior chamber. The intracambrial injection of air results in formation of only the lower two-thirds of the chamber, signifying that there is still some apposition between the superior iris and the cornea. And let's see how we address this. Through the second paracentesis created on the right, some more air is injected and this results in the complete formation of the anterior chamber with air. Now you can form the anterior chamber either with air or with viscoelastic. As a personal choice, I prefer air. The important point here really is that having a well-formed chamber allows you to titrate the tightening of the sutures more optimally. Moreover, it also helps in burying of the sutures, which you will find out a little later on in this surgery. Then again, it is a personal choice whether you'd like to take all the sutures and bury them or take one and bury it and then move to taking the next suture. My choice would be to take all the sutures and then bury them once and for all. Another important aspect that I'd like to discuss is what should be the length of the sutures. Now, the length of the suture is determined by the point of entry of the needle into the cornea and its point of exit on the other side across the tear. The sutures do need to be adequately long. This enables the proper apposition of the two edges of the tear and moreover allows for ease of burial of the sutures. Please note that if your sutures were to be too close to the edge of the wound, it could result in a cheese wiring in this anyway friable and damaged edematous tissue. This is because if the suture needs to be replaced because it's either too tight or too loose and it is buried, the overall tissue trauma would clearly be a lot more if my suture were to be buried. Now here's another point. I pay attention to the spacing of my sutures. I like there to be an equal spacing between my sutures and in an ideal scenario, if it were an absolutely straight tear, I'd like them all to be parallel to each other. Now whether or not they are parallel depends on the orientation of the tear. I make sure that each of my sutures remains perpendicular to the tangent at that point of the tear. So it's not always possible to get them parallel nor equidistant each and every time. Please watch now how the next few sutures are taken. Now when you end up taking a few sutures, you might find like in this case, the third suture on the right seems to be a little loose. So that may need to be taken again. And that is what you see happening in this part of the video. The surgeon is actually pulling out one suture which seems to be a little looser now that the others have been tightened. And now a new suture is going to be taken in its place. I sometimes find this to be the case with the first or the second suture that I've taken. You must also ensure that the suture ends when you cut them are short because sometimes if they are left too long and moreover if they have been inappropriately buried, they are likely to be exposed as the edema goes down and cause a significant amount of foreign body sensation. I'd like to share at this point that I like to take my corneal sutures on a relatively dry cornea. I mean, I moisten it from time to time, but it's largely relatively dry. This aids in preventing the entanglement of the sutures 
thereby making the suturing a lot easier. Following these principles, the entire corneal tear is sutured with multiple interrupted tenoproline sutures. On some occasion while taking the sutures, you're likely to even lose your anterior chamber. Now here's how you proceed. You continue to take the bite through both ends of the corneal tear, but before you tighten the suture, ensure that you reform the anterior chamber. This allows for optimal tightening of the suture. And this is what you'll see in this part of the video. In this manner, this corneal tear was sutured most elegantly with the help of 11 tenonylon sutures. The final step is burying the sutures. Now this needs to be done by affording adequate counter pressure which in this case is being afforded by pulling on the eye upwards and whilst doing so the sutures are held firm and buried in a downward direction. Burying the sutures with a formed anterior chamber in this case with air makes the burying of the sutures a lot easier. Sometimes whilst burying some of the sutures may snap. All you need to do is retake these sutures. And one of the important take home messages is that once you've completed taking all the sutures, do not consider the case complete until each of them is buried. And after burying, you ensure that each of these sutures is optimally tight. And this is what the end result looks like. The case is completed by the intracambral injection of 0.2 ml of 0.5% non-preserved moxifloxacillin. Both the paracentesis incisions are then hydrated. And this is the end result of the surgery.